a lot of people struggle with what to use their sketchbook for. What do you put in it? Is it okay to draw this? Is it okay to sketch that? What exactly is a sketchbook for? Well, I've been drawing in a lot of sketchbooks over a lot of years, and so has my friend Jason Doss. And today we're going to talk about his life in keeping a sketchbook and all the different things that he's done with it and what is its use in his creative life. We're also going to talk about the classes that he teaches at Sketchbook School in our Spark membership program because he's one of our many beloved teachers and he teaches people how to break down creative barriers, how to expand their imaginations, and how to literally draw anything. He's a great artist, a great teacher, and a great friend of mine, and a longtime member of the staff of Sketchbook School. So let's talk to Jason Doss about what do you do with a sketchbook? Hi, Jason. How you doing? Hey, Danny. I'm doing great. Glad to be here with you. Great. Good. Well, I'm really excited to look to talk to you about f filling a sketchbook, making art, how we in incorporate that into our regular lives, and really this question of what what are we supposed to put in our sketchbook? You know, and I think that there's a lot of misconceptions around it. And uh, I think we can make make it easy and talk about what you teach and what you do in your own sketchbooks um, to, to kind of answer this question. So tell me a bit about how long have you been keeping a sketchbook? That's a great question. I'm going to say since 2005 on a, on a serious level. And why I say on a serious level is as a kid and a teenager, I had sketchbooks and drew in them, but then there was a big gap. Right. And I think, so there's this, this art you make as a child and then the art you figure out how to make it as an adult for a lot of us, there's a gap there. Um, but I'd say since 2005, that's when I really got into to observational drawing as a regular thing that I was doing as, as an adult. Um, and that's a long time ago now, just, just doing the math on that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what you're describing is very common. It's like, we all had like that one or two sketchbooks in high school. We did the stuff and then we kind of lost our way with it. And, and I think even when we were doing it in high school, we may not necessarily have had any particular plan with it. You know, we're not really, it might've been like a place where you kind of doodled or you drew rock stars or you did like lettering, whatever. It was just kind of a sort of a, I didn't, mine was at least it's just kind of like a potpourri of just junk and stuff like that. And I look back on it. I'm like, Oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. And then you yeah, but my new ones, my new ones are like that, Danny. Mm -hmm. um, and and actually, I, th I think I was more of a purist for a while. Um, and when I was really deep into sort of my identity as an urban sketcher, it was like this, this book shall only have urban sketching in it. And now it's, it's a mess like you were talking about. Um, and it's a place to try out ideas. It's a place to try different things. But it's better than when I was a teenager because I'm better than I was when I was a teenager. I mean, the whole older and wiser thing. It's, it's true, right? So I, everything I do now is at a higher level or I'm better at contextualizing and res rescuing it, right? If it, if it sucks, I know how to unsuck it. Teenagers can't do that. Teenagers are just stuff making, stuck making stuff that sucks and not knowing what to do about it. And that's, that's the feeling of being a teenager. Um, and I, I love not dealing with that anymore. There's, there's aspects of getting older that are difficult. And then, but that part is, is really nice. I will say also though, as my sketchbooks practice has gotten more diverse, it has also sometimes left the confines of a sketchbook more and more. Sure. And what I mean by that is loose sheets of paper, scrap paper have become a big part of it. And a project I'm actually working on now is figuring out how to compile the best of those loose sheets because I wish they were in a book. So I think I'm going to build a sketchbook out of existing artwork, something like a binder, a photo album, um, to get that stuff back together because I pushed past that boundary so far. I've got to reel it back in now. Yeah, I mean, sketchbook as a form is a really, it's very, very convenient. It's easy to carry with you, so you always have the drawing materials. It also, you can set it up chronologically. You can put it up on a shelf. You can organize it 
it is an old kind of, I have stacks of paper as well. And I also wish that those were in a sketchbook and you can get sleeves and put it in. But a sketchbook just as a thing, you can also turn the page. If it sucks, you turn the page and you move on. You leave it behind you. It's not gonna, it's not gonna haunt you if you don't let, let it. But I think it is a great form. So the question is really, what is appropriate to do it? Because I think we think, like, what do you think most people think that sketchbooks are for? People hear sketchbook and, well, I think they may think, oh, that's something a, a real artist has as a kind of like place where they, they form their ideas. So somebody working on big paintings, sculptures, big conceptual art, of course they keep a sketchbook and that's kind of where they think on paper. And that's true enough, right? Um, or, you know, these days of social media, I think, you know, you go on, on Instagram or Facebook and you look at the sketchbook artists and there's people producing what looks like amazing finished professional art in this book format. So that's super intimidating. Um, and then there's kind of what you were talking about before that almost teenage idea of just like, yeah, here's, here's my crush. Here's me trying some graffiti letters out. Here's, you know, this and that. And, and as I said, I think that's valid. Um, but I think what you said about the portability is, is key. Um, and what I said about how I'm not sure, you know, I'm using the book format as much anymore. It's because I haven't left the house in three years. I mean, this is just being realistic about our post pandemic time. So much of me really using sketchbooks and getting, I'll show you, but real pocket sized, uh, passport size turned out to be my favorite because it fit in my, any of my pockets, didn't take up a lot of space. I could take it with me anywhere. Right. Um, it was always with me. It was an extension of, of myself and my body and my clothing. And it wasn't a production. I've also taken an easel and a pallet out there and bought jugs of water and my big sun hat and all that. But that's idea. Of, so for me, that sketchbook is the thing that fits in my pocket and I can do anything in it wherever I am. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think, you, you said an obvious thing that we haven't left the house, so it doesn't really matter as much. But um, I think that to me, a sketchbook is it's a, a lab. It's uh, an archive. It's sort of a confidant. It is private, but it can be public if I want to share it. But I can also close it up and put it away and nobody sees it. Uh, it's just a lot of it is a really beautiful, compact little portable studio that goes into your, into your pocket. But now the, it brings us to the question of like, what is it that an artist does with it? Because I think when we think about studying art or learning to make art, we think, well, I should be taking life drawing classes or I should be, I don't know, copying the masters or I should be drawing bowls of fruit or something like that. There seem to be things, but I, mean, I find that for me, my art has just been my life. Right. And I think that you're kind of like that, too. It's just what's the stuff of our life? It's, and you can often do drawings that turn out to be really interesting, but they're of really uninteresting things. It might be, you know, a, like a garbage can and can be a really great drawing or, a, you know, some falling down building or some some old shoe. They can all be interesting. Absolutely. I think I think daily life as we actually encounter it is is much more interesting than what most of us grab from our imagination. And, you know, it can be interesting to draw fantasy scenes and all that, but um, the things that, that just fall in between the cracks of daily life are actually interesting and how people get obsessed about having a style as an artist. And it, to me, it's, it's how you draw that stuff. If you draw, you know, if I just made you stop every once an hour for five minutes and make a drawing of whatever you could see, we're all going to do that differently. And that's, it's going to come out differently. Um, even if we all sit around and draw the same trash can, it's going to come out differently. And it's going to be a lot more interesting, I think, than if we all sit around and draw the same historic building. Because with that historic building, we're sort of replicating the postcard, whether we like it or not. Um, with that trash can, that trash can will never be on a postcard. And so we're bringing something to it and it's going to be dented. It's going to be dirty. It's going to have a life. That historic building is preserved. It's artificial. Um, and so I think these in-between messy things, not necessarily ugly things, trash trash can maybe, oh, that sounds ugly, but 
A classic example would be a gnarled old tree, right? That's sort of a classic art archetype, um, but also something that you have to observe it to really understand how that tree is gnarled in that way. And that's so beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think when I think about my, my phone and the camera in my phone, I probably take 10 pictures a day and they might be like, oh, I need to replace this handle on a closet. So I take a picture of it to have with me when I go to Home Depot or I bought a new pair of shoes and I take a picture of my foot wearing the shoe or I had a sandwich for lunch. And I take a picture of it. You take those kinds of things to me. I do the drawing equivalent of that a lot of the time where I'm just drawing like just random things, but they mean something to me. And they're also a way of capturing the memory. Yeah. Yeah. Although it's interesting what you said about the photos. A lot of this sound like a practical kind of to-do list. And, yeah. I, and I do that as well. And something that I have been doing more recently is not necessarily for every little project, but for some of the bigger things I'm doing around the house and garden is sketching as a preparatory stage towards that. So, and realizing that if I want to make something or change something in, in the space that I control, sketching it out, not, I don't think it's what an architect or an interior designer would do, but I actually don't know because I don't have any of their training. So what I'm doing is finding my own way to visualize, here's a thing that doesn't exist yet, but I would like it to. Um, and so that is a imaginative sketching, because like I said, it's thing that doesn't exist yet, um, but it's so personal and specific too. It's about having lived in that space and then conceiving of it in a different way um, or documenting it as it is, absolutely. Yeah, because I think part of urban sketching is also just uh, random street corners, I mean, sometimes they're famous buildings, but sometimes it's random street corners. It's a bus stop. It's, you know, and it's, that's, the good and, ones are the good, yeah. the good ones are the bus stops and the, the, you know, it's, it's not the pretty food that, that they serve you. It's, it's all the plates and bottles on the table afterwards. Right. That, that's where, that's the life. You're not documenting someone else's work. When you draw the pretty building or you draw the perfectly plated food, that's someone else's work that you're documenting. And there's nothing wrong with that. Same with drawing a model who's posing. That's the model is doing the work of the pose and you, you're translating it into your view and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're drawing people who are just going about their daily life or you're drawing, like I said, that table after the meal, that is something that nobody created on purpose to be looked at. Uh, nobody said, here's a thing. I'm going to make a thing that's that's great to view. No, it's just what what you see as you go through the world. And if we can document that, what we choose to document in that way and how we document it, built an art, artistic identity. I, I thought for a long time I wasn't a, a real artist because I didn't have big concepts. And, and being in the art world in New York City will do this to you because so much of it is conceptual. And I realized, no, I can just go through the world and document these in-between moments. A strong sense of artistic personality and style comes out the other end. Absolutely. Um, I don't need a concept. That is the concept. And that actually is, if we wanted to get all sort of art with a capital A about it, I think we really could say that that, that concept of documenting the real in between the cracks everyday life is a concept. Absolutely. I mean, look, you look at Van Gogh. Van Gogh was kind of doing that himself, right? He was, there were times where he tried to be high minded, but in the end, he painted boots and he painted a couple of sunflowers stuffed into a thing and he painted his his mailman and he painted, you know, a couple of houses on a street. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I th yeah, I think that those are, that's a, that's a pretty normal thing to do, I think, as an artist. And I think sometimes academics make it seem like it's a much more complex process, but I think recording life and, you know, whether it's Vermeer or, you know, Andy Warhol, I think it's that, that, that recording things and showing, making you look and say, you know what, look at the around you, look at your life, look at the world around you. It's beautiful. It's interesting. It's complex. It's significant. It has stories attached to it. And that's all you need. You don't need to paint grandness. You need to paint human sized stuff. And I think that's a lot of it. Another thing that you're doing also is you're using your sketchbook to conceptualize things, which are then turning into sculptures, for instance. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah. And that's newer for me. Um, I think because I, to some degree, didn't have the physical space. I moved a couple of years ago and have a lot more room in my, just literally room in my life now. Um, and, but I think it also uh, came with just an interest in making and building things. 
and realizing like, oh, I've got all this drawing experience. Of course, that's part of the process. I mean, it's only thinking later where I'm like, oh, I made all these sketches. I'm a sketch artist, blah, blah. You know, I didn't, but it's like a, I'm building, actually, I built a shelf for my sketchbooks, but I made sketches to build that. And it turned out they weren't that useful because I built it out of, um, I, I love using salvaged materials as well. So that's all built out of leftover wood from other things. So in that case, the sketches weren't as useful, but I, I built a sort of a fortress to keep the squirrels out of my garden and some benches and I sketched them out first. Um, I built some, some clay sculptures. I, I actually took a, a figure sculpting class. So it is like, you know, there is a model posing, but I was working in clay instead of on paper. Very disorienting for me, super difficult. I, I made about 12 sculptures and I like one of them. Um, but I sketched before I got into the clay and some of those sketches I like and having the sketch to reference as I'm making the 3D sculpture was essential. Um, I did a kind of a amateur attempted inlay on an old guitar that I fixed up and sketching out those patterns that I was going to do for that was essential. And because I'm somebody who draws a lot and uses a sketchbook a lot, it's related to all that other work. I can't separate 15 years of urban sketching from me drawing flower patterns to put into a guitar because it's the same hand drawing it. It's the same sense of visual organization and, vi and visual experience. Um, there's no gap in the continuity, even though these sound like different things, like inlay on a guitar versus painting a sunset, right? Those, those seem unrelated, but because it's me, it's actually all the same thing. Right. It's it's thinking on paper. It's 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 creating something out of nothing, or else it's identifying something that deserves to be captured. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's trying things out. Um, paper is so cheap, and drawing materials, at least some of them, are so inexpensive. Um, and I do, I save junk mail and draw on the back of it. I mean, to, uh, for better or worse, some of my best work is on, with the worst materials. Um, so this idea, I actually haven't purchased art supplies in a very long time because I got too many. Um, and there's a part of me, it's like, I may never buy art supplies again. And so many people go into this and it's, look, people like shopping. I get it. Um, but you don't need that much. A, a ballpoint pen and a school pencil and some junk mail is sufficient, you know, and even then, I mean, a, a Sharpie and some whiteout on the inside of a cereal box, you can make amazing looking work. So, and I think the sketchbook by being, uh, there are expensive sketchbooks, but the idea that you could get something from the, from the drugstore, from the dollar store, and your thinking will be just as strong as if you get the $40 sketchbook from the art supply store. And the thinking is actually the thing of it. Um, you can't really frame a sketchbook and put it on the wall anyway. You can take pictures of it and, and, and do that kind of thing. But there's something about the sketchbook and using quote unquote garbage materials that resists the possibility of it becoming presentation. So I also do, I do like nice watercolor paintings. I, I made a bunch around the holidays as gifts and I'm very happy with them. But you know, those, you're making it to go on a wall. And it's such a different energy from what I'm doing on scrap paper or in a sketchbook where it can't be elevated beyond a certain point. And that's so liberating. Yeah. I mean, in the end, a sketchbook is you and the sketchbook. When you're making something, as you say, to be framed, to be sold, to be mass produced in some way, it is a different expression, different relationship, a different process, different experience that you're having. So so, you know, that's why to me, the most authentic stuff is the stuff that it's just you, the sketchbook, a pencil, it's not, that's it. It's funny you, yeah. you, you in a sketchbook though, because another great thing about a sketchbook is you can share it very easily. So if you are an actual, I think I dragged you into this at least once, Danny, but if, you, if you're physically sharing space with someone, they can draw in your sketchbook, you can draw in their sketchbook, you can both draw in the same sketchbook, you can pass it around the table, um, one of my favorite things about getting together with other urban sketchers, actually, you're sitting around having a meal and everyone passes their sketchbooks around and you're looking through each other's work. And it, it's so different from scrolling through each other's social media profiles, even though I guess it's the same thing. 
So the portability of the sketchbook also leads to the shareability of the sketchbook. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Absolutely. I agree. Let's talk about speaking about uh, sharing work. Let's talk about your teaching. Um, you're teaching two classes as part of Spark. Can you let's talk about each one individually? Yeah. So I, I've got two classes. One, one is called, uh, I think it's improvising or improvisation. And I call it improv because I can't remember which. Um, and then the other is draw your world. But I'll talk about the improv class first. And that's when I was coming up with the concepts for the classes. I was like, well, what do I care about consistently as a theme through all of my art making? And what's something I want to help students with? And it is this concept of improvisation that you don't know exactly what you're going for. And extra careful planning is not the way you're going to get there. And it's about valuing the process. And it's about being responsive and being in the moment. I'm also a musician um, and interested in sort of performance art and all that. And improvisation is sort of a more obvious thing there. Oh, of course, interpretive dancers improvise. Of course, certain kinds of music you improvise. And you think about, well, yeah, jazz musician, musician improvises, but within a very strict context. Um, there's certain conventions that are, if not learned through years of effort, at least agreed upon between you know, the, the audience and the musician or the different musicians. And what if we bring that to a visual art concept? So what if I say, here's your constraints for the day, everybody, but within that, do whatever you want. And because it's a time-based class, you know, it's, it's, it's starts at the beginning, ends at the end. It's, it's not like a book that you'd skip pages in or something. You, you, you follow it very linearly. I can throw curveballs into the middle so I can introduce a concept. Um, and then halfway through, I can say, okay, now, just by way of example, flip it upside down, make it work that way. Um, and so this, this idea that there are certain shared parameters that everyone in the class is working with, but each student's goal is to take it in their own direction creatively. And I have just been so impressed with what the students come up with. It's, it's been magical. And I'll, sure, I'll take credit for giving them the launch pad, but that's all I've done. Um, and people make work that they never could have imagined because they needed those constraints to set them up. They had it inside themselves, but until I created the direction for them to go in, the maze for them to escape, it wasn't going to happen. So that's been really gratifying as a teacher um, to just set the students up, give them problems to solve, essentially. I, I give you as a student a problem to solve every week, and you come back with something. And sometimes, honestly, the work is not good. You know, it says the student, says me, whoever, but the process is, the thinking's amazing. And they're gonna take that skill and that approach and that thinking, that, that expanded thinking to their next piece, which will be great. So it's not always about making a great result, but it is about having a really uh, mind expanding process along the way. I mean, I know people, love that class and are doing lots of interesting things and going to places they've never gone before and that you're giving them a lot of, you're giving them a, a, a sandbox with defined edges, but you're also allowing them play, to play in whatever direction and whatever way they want to. So they emerge, I think, with satisfying results, but also having had a really great and, and experience that has helped them to grow. What about your yeah, other? Yeah. Sure. sure. Yeah. The, well, I was just going to say for improv, sometimes they leave that sandbox but that's okay because they still are doing it in the context of having left the sandbox. Right. So it's still different from giving them just a blank slate and saying, do whatever. And, and anyway, and many of them stay in the sandbox and just surprise me and themselves. The other class, well, it's really the opposite. It's called draw your world. And it's an observational drawing class, very strictly. I mean, the title is draw your world, but really it is how to draw what you see if we're going to be boring about it. And, I think it's something I enjoy doing, but I also just consider it so fundamental. Um, all of my imaginative drawing is still informed by the observational drawing I've done. Uh, there's no way within my head and my hand and on my page to separate everything I've drawn from what I've, I've drawn observationally from what I'm drawing imaginatively. So even if your goal is not to sit on the street corner and draw every car, if you do that, you'll draw better from imagination. And if your goal is to sit on the street car and the corner and be able to drive every car, I'm going to teach you how to do it. 
And the underlying philosophy for the Draw Your World class is that we can draw anything we can see. So you don't have to study um, how cars are made, for example. You don't have to study human anatomy. You don't have to study botany. You just have to be able to look at a plant or look at a person or look at a car or look at it. You don't have to study perspective in terms of three point and vanishing point and all that nonsense. Um, you just have to be able to see. So it's how to take what you see and put it onto the page. Um, we tend to focus on, we might have a segment on drawing cars or on drawing people who are sitting down or, or that kind of thing, but it's secret is it's all kind of the same. The, the way that you draw the car and you draw the person sitting down and you draw the town square and you draw the airplane and you draw the field, it's the same core fundamental skills. On the one hand, I feel like I'm repeating myself every time. On the other hand, I know I'm not because the students are taking it in, in so many great, great directions and build just constantly building that fundamental score, the skill set. It's like if you if you go to the yoga class every week, right? There's not a new pose every week. It would actually not be helpful to have a new pose every week. But going through that work together and reinforcing those fundamentals is healthy for you and just makes you better at drawing. Yeah, I mean, it always makes me shudder a little bit when people say, I can't draw hands, I can't draw cars, I can't draw ducks, whatever it is. It's like, well, I'm not sure what the, why. <laughs> because you're right. thinking, you're thinking, oh, it's a duck, I can't draw those. But once you, once you get comfortable, as you're saying, with draw the world, draw literally everything. And you'll also discover that there's a lot of interesting things to draw that you hadn't necessarily thought of. So I think that that's part of it too, is that you can, the pleasure of drawing, that's really ultimately what we're getting at. It's not what you're drawing, it's the pleasure of drawing, the pleasure of looking intensely, of feeling, of seeing lines come out of you and, and cover the page. That feeling is so strong that it doesn't really matter what the thing is that's prompting it, whether it's a, a naked lady or a building or, or whatever it is, uh, it's really in you and how you're feeling. I think that that's so cool, so key. Yeah. And, and what I love about doing it in a group class context is on, you know, draw your world. We'll have a source photograph that everyone's drawing from. Nobody's drawings look the same. And it's, Again, it's not people trying to put their own style on it. Um, it's just we all have different physical approaches to drawing. We all are attracted to different aspects of the thing we're drawing. Um, and there's so much value in doing these things with other people because you see that. And you might you can put value judgments in it. Oh, I did that better than them or they did that better than me. But then there'll be some other aspect where that's flipped. Um but it's just that diversity and difference of even in the exact same context with the same assignment, because I'm not teaching style. I'm not teaching how to draw. Don't want you to draw like me ever. Um, I'm teaching how to see and turn that what you see into your own drawing. Um, churning out clones of drawing like Jason would be the, the worst thing from my perspective. Um, and, but what I do want to help you do is, is to see better so that you can draw like you. Um, so I, I know that people are getting a huge amount out of both of your classes. What is your experience? What is it like for you to be teaching in spark? And, you know, how do you find the, the students? They're not, they're not necessarily, you know, college students who I know you've taught, um, they are, you know, ad adults who are coming back to art. What is your experience of, of working with them? Yeah, I, well, I actually really enjoy teaching more, I hate to say mature students, but, um, but they are. So I, I like teaching young people, but young people are, are still trying to figure out who they are in the world. I, well, we all are, and we should, we should never stop. But, but I think people know what I mean. There's something about somebody who has figured out how to live life to some degree or had to do it anyway for enough decades. And what you bring to the drawing, because you're just drawing because you want to, um, not not because you're trying to prove something or get it up into something or impress in some shallow level. You're just trying to improve yourself. So being around that energy has been re really nice. Um, everyone's there because they want to be there. No one's there because they have to be there. Um, 
and that and that's great and i just love seeing the different for the for the more creative assignments just the the reference points and the ideas people bring to it and sometimes it's been really nice for me where i help people return to a childlike sense of of wonder about what they can draw that i can tell has been absent for a long time mm. and the the way that a a seven-year-old will just draw anything they can think of um giving that to a 70 year old or to a 35 year old or whoever is so such a cool experience so i really enjoy those um but then there's also just little bits of people's everyday life that that pop up and we end up learning about each other um without sharing anything private but it's just people from all different backgrounds gathering together to work on the same thing you get to know each other through through your approach to drawing so i've really enjoyed that um and i just really as a teacher i fundamentally i want to help people get better at what they're trying to do so i'm really not just trying to help you have a pleasant day you know pushing paint around nothing wrong with that but no if you show up to my class especially the draw your world class i'm trying to make you better at something so it's much more like a, a personal trainer in that sense um you are here to to leave with with more skills and ability than you came in with um and to give that to the students it's, it's a great feeling um, and, and I will push people. I hope I do it in a nice way, of course, cause, cause I'm, it's, it's meant to be positive. Um, but you're never too old or inexperienced to learn how to get better at this stuff. It's, it's available to everyone. Um, you're going to find your own approach to it as you do more of it. Uh, the more, the more people do, the more their own styles deepen and develop. And that's really gratifying to see as well. Um, but just the sense of if we take this down to fundamentals and we communicate well about it, anyone can do it and anyone can be great at it. Absolutely. Well, th that's great. Yes. And um, thank you so much for being part of Spark. Thank you for, for being part of Sketchbook School. For You've been part of Sketchbook School for so long now and in lots of different forms. And it's really great to, to have you as, as part of our family. Um, thank you for, for today as well and for sharing your work with us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me as a part of Sketchbook School for so long. I've, I've loved seeing Sketchbook School develop and, and this latest round of being involved in Spark has been nice because it's not just showing up for one thing and then putting it out into the world. It's this ongoing relationship with the students that, that has been so good for everybody. So I really, it's been, it's been, again, gratifying for me as a teacher to work with the people that Sketchbook School brings together. I don't know where you find everyone, but it's so cool they all end up together there. And it's been really wonderful to, to be there for them. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks, Danny. Jason is such a great teacher. He explains things so clearly and gives you so much kind of energy and motivation to get going. So I think it's, it's small wonder that so many of our students have just taken off since they've been taking classes with Jason. Jason is part of the Spark membership group, which is part of Sketchbook School, where we teach two to three hours of classes virtually every day. And uh, Jason's class is one of many that we teach on drawing, and watercoloring, and gouache, and urban sketching, and portraiture, and all kinds of stuff. If you'd like to learn more about Spark and think about possibly taking a class with Jason, you can join us for our special two-week free trial period and jump in and see whether Spark works for you. I think it will. And I think Jason will show you how to keep start keeping a sketchbook and what to fill it with. And believe me, you will go through sketchbook after sketchbook once he fires you up and sparks your imagination. Thanks for joining me. And hopefully I'll see you at Spark. Just go to sketchbookschool.com and sign up. Bye-bye.